Finally, the state aided the growth of manufacturers through mercantilism. Modern exponents of the, quote, free market generally treat mercantilism as a misguided attempt to promote some unified national interest, adopted out of sincere ignorance of economic principles. In fact, the architects of mercantilism knew exactly what they were doing. Mercantilism was extremely efficient for its real purpose, making wealthy manufacturing interests rich at the expense of everyone else. Adam Smith consistently attacked mercantilism, not as a product of economic error, but as a quite intelligent attempt by powerful interests to enrich themselves through the coercive power of the state. British manufacturing was created by state intervention to shut out foreign goods, give British shipping a monopoly of foreign commerce, and stamp out foreign competition by force. As an example of the latter, British authorities in India destroyed the Bengalese textile industry, makers of the highest quality fabric in the world. Although they had not adopted steam-driven methods of production, there is a real possibility that they would have done so, had India remained politically and economically independent. The once prosperous territory of Bengal today is occupied by Bangladesh and the Calcutta area. The American, German, and Japanese industrial systems were created by the same mercantilist policies with massive tariffs on industrial goods. Free trade, quote-unquote, was adopted by safely established industrial powers who used laissez-faire as an ideological weapon to prevent potential rivals from following the same path of industrialization. Capitalism has never been established by means of the free market, or even by the primary action of the bourgeoisie. It has always been established by a revolution from above, imposed by a pre-capitalist ruling class. In England, it was the landed aristocracy. In France, Napoleon II's bureaucracy. In Germany, the Junkers. In Japan, the Meiji. In America, the closest approach to a natural bourgeois evolution, industrialization was carried out by a mercantilist aristocracy of federalist shipping magnates and landlords. Romantic medievalists like Chesterton and Belloc described the process in the High Middle Ages by which serfdom had gradually withered away and the peasants had transformed themselves into de facto freeholders who paid a nominal quit rent. The feudal class system was disintegrating and being replaced by a much more libertarian and less exploitive one. Immanuel Wallerstein argued that the likely outcome would have been a system of relatively equal small-scale producers further flattening out the aristocracies and decentralizing the political structures. By 1650, the trend had been reversed, and there was a reasonably high level of continuity between the families that had been high strata in 1450 and in 1650. Capitalism, far from being the overthrow of a backward aristocracy by a progressive bourgeoisie, was brought into existence by a landed aristocracy which transformed itself into a bourgeoisie because the old system was disintegrating. This is echoed in part by Arno Meyer, who argued for continuity between the landed aristocracy and the capitalist ruling class. The process by which the high medieval civilization of peasant proprietors, crafts guilds, and free cities was overthrown was vividly described by Kropotkin. Before the invention of gunpowder, the free cities repelled royal armies more often than not, and won their independence from feudal dues. And these cities often made common cause with peasants in their struggles to control the land. The absolutist state and the capitalist revolution it imposed became possible only when artillery could reduce fortified cities with a high degree of efficiency, and the king could make war on his own people. And in the aftermath of this conquest, the Europe of William Morris was left devastated, depopulated, and miserable. Peter Tosh had a song called 400 Years. Although the white working class has suffered nothing like the brutality of black slavery, there has nevertheless been a 400 years of oppression for all of us under the system of state capitalism established in the 17th century. Ever since the birth of the first states 6,000 years ago, political coercion has allowed one ruling class or another to live off other people's labor. But since the 17th century, the system of power has become increasingly conscious, unified, and global in scale. 
the current system of transnational state capitalism, without rival since the collapse of the Soviet bureaucratic class system, is a direct outgrowth of the seizure of power 400 years ago. Orwell had it backwards. The past is a boot smashing a human face. Whether the future is more of the same depends on what we do now.